this morning. If you'll take your Bibles, please turn to the book of Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. I'd like to begin by reading from verse number 43 down to verse number 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 through 47. And after you've found your place, if you would follow along as I read these words, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 43, the Bible says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And this morning, I want to direct your attention in particular to the last verse of that passage of scripture, verse number 47, and the latter part of that verse, which says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And I want to speak for a few moments on the topic of divine addition, divine addition. You know, in the field of mathematics, the basis of mathematics is arithmetic and if you don't understand arithmetic then you will never understand mathematics and the first step in basic arithmetic is addition when children begin their schooling and they get into the subject of math or uh, that area they begin with addition that's the first thing as I understand it they learn to count they learn to add And after they've mastered that, they progress into subtraction and then later to multiplication and then to division. But these are the basic functions of what is known as arithmetic and when those are mastered, then you can get into mathematics. Well, when it comes to spiritual matters, we see the same progression. In fact, it's interesting in the book of Acts that in the early chapters, the first six chapters, the Bible talks about the Lord adding to the church but when you get to chapter 6 and beyond it turns to multiplication when the number of the disciples was multiplied and so even in spiritual matters everyday matters of of following and serving the Lord we see that these functions do apply and you know we may not be living in times of multiplication but we sure need some additions You know, I wonder, people would say, well, we're living in different days, and that's true to a certain degree. In this particular instance that we've read, there were many wonders and signs that were done by the apostles. And we know that since the death of the apostles and since the end of the apostolic age, there are no more signs that these are passing, these were passing gifts that were given Uh, for the authenticating of the word of God that was not yet written. And so for that reason, then many more people were saved and added and later multiplied, and we don't have that today. I wonder if we're just using that somewhat as an excuse because my question is, are the signs of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, any uh, more powerful than the word of God, which is the word of the Spirit of God? Uh, The Spirit of God is the one who does that marvellous work of regeneration. It's not our work. And as we preach and teach the gospel, it is the Spirit who uh, brings conviction of sin and brings a, a man or a woman to the place of conversion and rebirth and so forth. But certainly we do need to see additions in our church, and that is, as has been mentioned this morning, Uh, the emphasis that we're going to have for the coming month of August. So in preaching this message, I want it to be a personal challenge to you, first of all, to understand God's will, and then secondly, for you to take 
the steps necessary to implement God's will in your own life. Now, it's all very well for us to know what the Bible says and to know what God expects, but there is also the doing of the word. And I want to use this to challenge and to to encourage each of us to take those steps that are necessary to get involved as we look forward to this coming month. You know, as arithmetic is to the greater field of mathematics, this message is very basic, but it's also very important and necessary. And so as we look at this passage of scripture, and in particular the latter part of verse number 47, I want to ask and I want to answer from the Bible four questions, four questions that uh, will just remind us of what God wants for each of us to do. And the first question is simply, to what does the Lord add? To what does the Lord add? Now, the Bible gives us the answer to that. In verse 47, the Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So it is the church. And in the context, historically, this was the church that Jesus had established during his earthly ministry and had left there in the upper room praying in Jerusalem as they were preparing for him to return to heaven. They were the church, the first church that was established by Jesus Christ. But we understand, of course, biblically, that it now refers to all New Testament churches that have descended from that church that Jesus built. I'm not referring to just anything that calls itself a church. You know, there's a lot of human organizations that have put the word church up on a notice board or on a letterhead or something like that, but we're talking about a biblical, scriptural, New Testament church that follows the faith of the New Testament and the order of the New Testament and uh, one that teaches and preaches the pure gospel and the word of God. And so the Lord added to the church, and that is the will of God, to add members to the church. Look over, if you will, in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 15. Here the Bible uh, uses the same thought, but in a different uh, way of putting it. The Acts chapter 5 and verse number 14 says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, both multitudes of men and women. In Acts 2.47, they were added to the church, such as should be saved. In Acts 5.14, those who were saved were added to the Lord. So what does that mean, believers were added to the Lord? Well, I think the answer is found where Paul was writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. And he said to the church, he said, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. By the way, he said, you are the body of Christ. Speaking of a, if I can use the term, a local church that was there located in the city of Corinth. He didn't say you were part of the body of Christ. He said, you are the body of Christ. Just as God would look at Bible Baptist Church and say, you are the body of Christ. And so when believers are added to the Lord, they're added to the body, which is the same as being added to the church. That's what the Bible means. In fact, the New Testament uses the metaphor of a human body to describe a church and the church's relationship to Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, And he, that is Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. So the body of Christ and the church, the assembly of baptized believers, is one and the same thing. The word body is used to to give us an image or a picture of what a church is like and how it is to function. And Christ is the head of the body, the church, and Colossians 1.18 makes that very clear. So when the Bible talks about adding members to a church, it's the same as adding members to the body of Christ or adding them to the Lord's body. And we understand that the New Testament doctrine of a church does not teach a universal, invisible, all-inclusive entity. It's talking about a visible assembly 
that you, something that you can see, something that gathers in one place, made up of those who are saved and have been baptised and part of that church body. In fact, uh, I want to ask you a question here, just in your understanding of the book of Acts and the New Testament in general, can you think of any example in the book of Acts and beyond where church membership was presented as an option? Where it's up to you if you want to be part of a church or not. I'll tell you, that is the attitude of the age we're living in. There are many today who will say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, uh, but, you know, I'm not going to get involved in some church organisation. I'm not going to be really part of... That's not my thing. Well, it's not a matter of your thing. It's a matter of God's will. And maybe I'm missing something here, but I think as I read the New Testament that it was just a, a natural thing. When you got saved then you would be added, the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. Saved people need to be part of a, a scriptural church. That's the will of God. You know, uh, I believe that that's something that we need to consider today. People today want to have a take it or leave it kind of Christianity. It's kind of like an insurance policy to them perhaps where if I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, and so everything else is really up to me if I feel like it. I don't believe that's how God presents his will in the Bible. And so the first question that we ask is, uh, to what were they added? Well, the answer is they were added to the church. I believe that's God's will, is to add to his church. The second question is this, how were they added? How were they added? Well, if you look back here in Acts 2.47, it tells us that the saved were added to the church. Uh, you don't get added to the church in order to be saved. Let's understand that. Uh, some people believe that in order to get to heaven, I've got to be a faithful member of a church. No, that's not God's plan. That's not scriptural. But the saved, those who were saved, born again, by the Spirit of God, the next step was for them to be added to a church. And Acts chapter 5 tells us that they were added to the body. But the process and the answer to the question, how are they added, is seen in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. If you'll just look up a little bit from that passage we read, Acts 2.41 gives us the way that God adds people to a New Testament church. It says, then they that gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, there's a consistent New Testament order that is found in this verse of Scripture. Notice it says, first of all, they that gladly received his word. Now, that's really referring to salvation. You say, how do you say that? Well, first of all, whose word? They that gladly received his word. Well, it's referring, if you look back to chapter 2 and verse 14, it's talking about Peter. Peter is one of the apostles, and uh, he is one of them preaching on this day of Pentecost. And verse 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now at the end, they that gladly received his word, which is, they mean they responded to the preaching of Peter. What word did he preach? Did he get up and talk about the weather? Did he talk about his family or... Uh, what he was planning for the future or uh, 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 current events or whatever? No. What was the word that Peter preached? Well, you can read the whole sermon, but look at verse 22. This is the, the nutshell of his sermon. He said in verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered 
by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, what was he preaching here? Well, he's preaching the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15, that's the definition of the gospel message, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So they received that word, the good news of Jesus Christ as the saviour. And so how did they receive the word? Well, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. That's conviction of sin. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> That's a great response. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Repentance and faith. That was the response that was required. And so as Peter got up and preached the gospel, and men came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were found out. They realized that they were the ones responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. And they said, man, what shall we do? How do we get saved? And he said, repent. And he said, and believe. Believe the gospel. That's the same today that we preach. When you get under conviction of sin, the answer is Jesus Christ. And uh, repentance and faith are uh, taught together, the two sides of one coin. You can't have scriptural repentance without scriptural faith, and you can't have scriptural faith without scriptural repentance. It means to turn from your sins and to turn to Christ and receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. And they that gladly received his word, not everybody did, but there were many who believed the preaching of the word of God. And then the Bible says after that, they were baptized. They were baptized. That is the next step for every Christian. When you are saved, God says you need to identify with Jesus Christ and his death and burial and resurrection through the waters of baptism. Now, baptism always follows salvation. Uh, you, you don't get baptized in order to be saved. You should be baptized because you were saved. It's not for babies. They that gladly received his word. And we have uh, some little ones down the back and they probably hear a noise coming from this pulpit, but they can't gladly receive the word. <laughs> not yet. We pray they will. But uh, these were people who could hear with understanding and the spirit of God could speak to them through the word of God. They got saved and they gladly received this, this gift of salvation and uh, then baptism followed. And we understand that, that for the Lord to add to the church, that's how he does it. He added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were baptized and became members. They were baptized because, notice also in verse number 41, then they that gladly received his word Number one, salvation, were baptized. Number two, baptism. And the same day there were added, added unto them about 3,000 souls. That was quite a day, wasn't it? Divide 3,000 souls by 12 apostles. <laughs> Baptizing with church authority, they had a good thing. There were a lot of pools in Jerusalem. And uh, that's a lot of work for that one day. It wasn't easy being an apostle, you know. Well, it was certainly a wonderful thing. But here's the thing. This is God's will for every, everyone, every believer, I should say, to become a member of the church. And God's word shows us how it is to be done. Now, there are a lot of other ideas floating around out there, but 
we want to look at see what God's word has to say. So how are they added? If the Lord added to the church daily, how, are, how does that happen? Salvation followed by baptism, which adds you to the church body. Question number three, by what means are they added? This is interesting, and actually this is where the message is supposed to impact all of the members of Bible Baptist Church. Look at Acts chapter 11, if you will. Acts chapter 11, and uh, this is somewhat of a topical message focusing on the word added, all right? So uh, uh, this will kind of get the, uh, put everything together here, but Acts chapter 11, verse 24, uh, referring, of course, to the, the beginnings of a church uh, in Antioch, up in Syria, the Bible says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And notice this, and much people was added unto the Lord. So Barnabas had a ministry there. And uh, these people, there was, there was a great harvest of souls uh, up there in Antioch. Now the Bible says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, Colossians 1.18. And in Acts chapter 2, it was Peter and the eleven who preached on the day of Pentecost and thousands were saved. In Acts chapter 7, it was Stephen who preached and many people were saved there in Samaria. In Acts chapter 9, it was Philip uh, who preached. Uh, I'm, I'm, I should have said uh, Stephen, he preached in Jerusalem. A lot of people got saved, but he also lost his life. Philip preached and... Uh, Many were saved there in Samaria. In Acts chapter 11, we see it's Barnabas who was preaching. So it is the preaching of the gospel that is going to see people come to know Jesus Christ as their saviour. But why did Barnabas go up to Antioch from Jerusalem? Well, he was sent, but go 300 miles to the north. Why did he go up there? Well, if you look back in Acts chapter 8, first of all, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Going back to Jerusalem here, uh, the Bible talks about the, uh, the persecution that arose. It says, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then verse number four says, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, those that were scattered abroad did not include the apostles. So, uh, if you think, well, that's purely the job of the preachers, the pastors, to do all of the preaching and soul winning and witnessing, you're mistaken. Because here the apostles are left in Jerusalem, the whole church is scattered. But verse 4 says that those that were scattered went everywhere preaching the word preaching the word of God. And that brings us back to Acts chapter 11, where Barnabas is sent to Antioch. But notice before that, in Acts 11, verse 19, now they that were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch spoke unto, the, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. You know, one thing I see from all of this is that first century Christians were very ardent when they preached the gospel to men. The Bible says in Acts 5 and verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In other words, this was a constant endeavor. It was daily in this case. Now that obviously didn't involve everyone uh, who had jobs and so forth to be daily preaching in that sense, but this was an, 
an everyday thing. This was not just a scheduled activity. This was part of their life, was to share Jesus Christ. They did so in the temple, the, the religious area, and they did it from house to house. Now, for what, what we need to think about here is that no one will be added to this church if we're just going to keep silent. And so we too have to reflect that, that uh, spirit of these early Christians that whether it's daily or uh, whatever, it's just part of our life that when we come across people and interact with people that we share Christ with them. That's one of the reasons we're going to have a friend day on the first Sunday of the month of August, the 7th of August. And by the way, it is true, if you're going to invite friends, you have to start now, not Saturday night before Sunday. Because people make plans and, and, uh, and don't just invite one friend because some people don't keep their commitments, but start now. Neighbours, friends, workmates, schoolmates, whoever it may be. It's friend day. And the idea is not just to bring friends, but to bring people who can hear a preaching of a, a straightforward, plain gospel message. That's what we'd like to accomplish. This last week, we were challenged to prepare a personal testimony, a, a, a card. I hope you got a copy of that and you could see how it can be done. Your testimony is unique to yourself, but just a simple means of meeting someone and giving them something to read with some scripture that will perhaps sow the seed and, and uh, certainly start up a conversation. It's a wonderful opportunity that we have. This is the, the means by which the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. To what were they added? They were added to the church. How does that happen? Salvation followed by baptism and church membership. The means that God uses are people like you and I. And then the fourth and last question I want to ask this morning is this. To what purpose are they added? Why did they join the church? Why were they added to the church? Well, church membership, certainly in Bible times, and I trust in your life, is not an incidental or a casual matter. Something that you can take or leave and say, well, yeah, I got other things that really are more important than being faithful in church and and so uh, I'll go to church when it suits me. Now, of course, we're not talking about if you come down sick, if you, you know, you have to be responsible, and we understand that, but uh, unless you are providentially hindered, that you will make church number one priority in your weekly planning. Why do I say that? Well, because in Acts chapter 2, we see that it was a very purposeful thing to be, be part of a church. There's a reason why God commands us to be church members. Look at verse number 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. I mean, here's a whole range of activities that are vital to our Christian life and they did it together. So there's a purpose here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18, the Bible says, Now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. That's a, a verse of scripture that's very interesting because it tells us that this idea of church membership is not something that we necessarily decide and if God, uh, I mean, if God blesses, that's fine. But no, he puts you in the church. He sets the members in the body. Now that's in the context of exercising your spiritual gift. And you need to know what your spiritual gift is so that you can plug in to the ministries of the church and exercise that gift. And God has put you in the church for that purpose. As somebody said, not just to sit and soak, <laughs> but to, to be involved in as much as is humanly possible. God has set you in the, in the body. Nothing is by chance. This is God's plan for your life as a Christian. Now, understand this as you say, well, I, I'm a Christian and I, I want to grow in the faith and in the knowledge of the truth. Understand that the Lord has provided three ways 
for you and me to be grounded in truth. Number one, he's given us the word of truth. John 17, 17, thy word is true. And uh, we have the Bible. Secondly, he's given us the spirit of truth. John 14, 17. So as a Christian with the indwelling spirit of God being our teacher and our guide as we read the scriptures, and he's the author of the scriptures, I mean, can you imagine that, sitting down with the one who, who gave us the Bible? And he will teach us and guide us and lead us in the understanding of truth. So we have the word of truth, we have the spirit of truth, but what a lot of people fail to understand is God has also given us the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, and the pillar and ground of the truth is the church of God, is the house of God, which is the church. And there is a very important purpose for you being a part of a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, New Testament Baptist church. It's not just an option. It's not just something to say, well, take it or leave it. This is the will of God. Church membership will impact your life with the truth. Turn, if you will, to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and... uh, I I want to explain this because this scripture really gives us the reason why belonging to a church and being faithful in church impacts us uh, perhaps in ways that we don't even realize until later in life. But in Ephesians 4, look at verse 14 if you would and verse number 15, here's God's will that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Yeah, I find that people who claim to be Christians but really don't care about being part of a church and are very casual about it maybe drifting from uh, organization to organization, they say it doesn't really matter, they tend to be more tossed to and fro. They're not grounded in the word of God. And God expects us to be grounded so that when the winds of false doctrine come, we're not just going to be caught up in that and, and go running after it, but we're going to stand for the truth of God's word. And uh, he wants us to, to grow up. That's spiritual maturity The Bible word is perfection, becoming mature, not sinless, but mature in our understanding of God's word. Now, that's the will of God and the accomplishment for that, the mechanism for that. If you look back up to verse 11 and 12, this is how God does it. Verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, we'll not uh, expound upon that. Prophets and uh, uh, apostles and prophets, that's the word of God, the New Testament. Uh, Evangelists, we know, are the church planters, and then the pastors and teachers that God raises up in a congregation. Now, what's the purpose? Well, threefold. Three goals for the pastor the perfecting of the saints. That is bringing you to maturity. Can you really be a mature Christian and all that God wants you to be if you're not part of a New Testament church? That's a good question. I don't think so. Because God has given you the pillar and ground of the truth and in that he's put pastors who are tasked with teaching you the truth so that you can become stronger and more mature throughout time and not be tossed about. So perfecting, number two, performing for the work of the ministry, for exercising your spiritual gifts. Do you understand that spiritual gifts were were given to be exercised for the edifying of the church? In the church, uh, the way the church ministers, and every church has different emphasis in getting the gospel out, but using your spiritual gift for the work of the ministry. So 
The purpose is for perfecting, for performing, and then really for perpetuating, because the Bible says for the edifying of the church here. This idea of edifying, you know, it's a, it's a word that has a relationship to the building. Uh, you talk about buildings as being edifices. Uh, it comes from the same idea there. And an edifice, when we speak of an edifice, we're talking about a building that is uh, solid, that is going to last and endure for a length of time. And not some, uh, uh, you know, some shamble that will be blown down in the next wind. And I was thinking about that, that the edifying of the church means the building up of the church, but what is the purpose of that? Building a church that will last through the generations. And that's important too. You know, in four and a half weeks' time or thereabouts, Bible Baptist Church will be celebrating 48 years of existence. Praise the Lord. But we also have to understand that unless the Lord comes, this church is going to go on for many, many years. What are we going to leave for the next generation? Are we going to leave a strong edifice, a spiritual building that will be a support to them and their families as they grow up and serve the Lord? Well, that's the goal, and that's one of the tasks that God has given uh, to, to those who lead the church is to, is, is to perpetuate that so that it will last for a long time. I know earthly buildings eventually decay and fall down, but, you know, the Lord has given promises to his church. Now, I say all of this simply to point to you from the Bible that there is a divine purpose in you belonging to a New Testament church. And so the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. To what were they added? They were added to the church, not to some human uh, club or society, but added to the church. How are they added? Salvation followed by baptism. The requirements for membership at Bible Baptist Church are just two that you are saved and then scripturally baptized. And how is all of this accomplished? It's accomplished through God's people preaching and teaching Jesus Christ on a daily, a continual basis, whether it's in the temple or in every house. That's how it's done. That's our responsibility. That's why we're having a friend day emphasis and even on into the month of August, every Sunday we'll have a particular emphasis, not just for our own entertainment, but as a means of encouraging others to come. Not that we just want to see the pews full, we want to have opportunity to preach Christ. And this is one way we can do it. Well, I understand this is a basic message. But as arithmetic is foundational to mathematics, so a message like this forms the basis for all that we are called upon to do. So what about it? What about it? Well, we do need to see some additions in our church. And the fact is we cannot sit on our blessed assurance waiting for transfers to come on in from other churches. I know we're somewhat of a military church and that happens and we thank God for adding to our church that way. But listen, we need to see people come through salvation and through baptism. So will you commit to stepping out by faith and making a real effort over these next several weeks? I think God is not limited in his power to save. (laughs) Uh, He saved you, he saved me. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Maybe it's we who just need to say, you know what, this is not just for these people here or for that group of people, this is to involve me. And whether it's a neighbor, a friend, an acquaintance, you can do something and uh, be praying for Friend Day. Perhaps I'm speaking to someone here today that needs to unite with this church. Are you saved? Was there a time in your life when you realized that you were a lost sinner and you realized that Jesus Christ was your only way of salvation? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Call upon him for salvation. That's where it all begins. 
When you're saved, the Lord will add you to the church, but you need to be saved, first of all. Or perhaps you are saved and you need to follow the Lord in baptism and be obedient and become part of the church. I don't know if that's the case with you, but if we want to see first century results, then we must take first century responsibility. So I trust that God's word will speak to our hearts today and challenge us to be diligent in this matter because I believe it is still the will of God. We cannot throw up our hands and say, well, this is the 21st century and we're in a different world and people are all different and people aren't interested. Well, maybe that's true to a certain degree, but the gospel is the same and the true need of every human being is the same. They need Jesus Christ. Let's decide to make that effort.